السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I'm Dr. Ahmad Khan. Uh, today I have a case of uh, field intubation referred from a uh, nearby hospital to us. And so today I would like to talk about uh, golden rules or concept in management of difficult intubation. Uh, this uh, few minutes will not be about the management itself of difficult intubation, which is markedly variable depending on many factors like uh, the equipment you have in your uh, facility, uh, your experience with this equipment, uh, the cause of difficult intubation itself. Uh, yeah, for example, if you have a patient with airway trauma, uh, glidus, uh, fiber optic will have no rule. But in comparison, if the patient with a small mouse opening, uh, the main uh, equipment for this intubation will be the fiber optic intubation. So the cause of the cause of difficulty of intubation, your experience, your equipment, the the emergency of the case, the case is elective emergency. Uh, in the cold cases or elective case, you have the possibility and the choice to cancel the case, like our case today. But in emergency cases, you don't have this choice. So many factors affect uh, uh, the decision and the management itself of difficult intubation and priority of each equipment. If you are talented with fiber optic, of course, it will be the first choice. Uh, but today, I don't want, I'll not talk about the management of difficult intubation, but I will talk about the golden five rules of the difficult Rule number one in difficult intubation is that failure of intubation does not kill the patient. Actually, what kills the patient is failure of ventilation. So if you don't ventilate, the, if you cannot intubate the patient, don't be manic. You still, the patient can survive. But your wrong procedure and your wrong management of the case may induce airway edema or severe uh, laryngeal spasm and bronchus bed. And if severe hyperventilation occurred and you cannot fix this, the patient may have permanent neurological damage or even this. So don't be panic if you fail to intubate as long as you can ventilate. So the main target is to maintain the patient ventilation. Uh, rule number two, that's endotracheal tube is not indicated in most of elective care services. So actually you can manage a case without intubation at all. Uh, as we see, uh, many surgeries does not have, the, you don't have to give general anesthesia at all. In limb surgery, you can give nerve block, in lower limb, in upper limb, in lower limb. You can use spinal anesthesia for pelvic surgery. You can use spinal anesthesia for abdominal surgery. You can use nerve block for breast surgery. So the indication of general anesthesia can, is limited in surgery nowadays in elective cases. And in most or in many cases, you can bypass the general anesthesia at all. You just give the patient nerve block, local infiltration, or centroaxial anesthesia. And even if you give the patient general anesthesia, you don't have to intubate him. As we can find that his laryngeal mask can, or subglottic devices can, you can many, many, many procedures can perform it under these devices. And even in position, uh, uh, even under this device, and you find that is the indication of, of intubation is actually uh, limited indications that you in elective surgery. Uh, tube is indicated that the patient have a risk of aspiration. When our elective surgery, usually the patient fasting for enough time. If the patient have uh, uh, airway obstruction, and in our elective cases, most of patient doesn't have the airway obstruction preoperative. And, or, or, and also if the patient has hemodynamic instability or impending or respiratory failure. And most of our cases in elective cases doesn't have these factors. So the indication of intubation is not exist in all patients who uh, will perform, have surgeries under general anesthesia. Even for positioning and bronze positioning, we find an, enough evidence nowadays supporting the use of laryngeal mask and considering its safety. In nasal surgery, there is also enough uh, coming evidence showing that laryngeal mask is actually safer than the endotracheal tube. It bypasses the stress response of intubation. It's easily management during hypotension. And many side effects of endotracheal tube can be minimized by using the uh, laryngeal mask or subglottic device. So the indication of intubation actually can be bypassed even if you want to give the patient general anesthesia. 
Rule number three, that be always ready. Always ready, that's meaning that's ready in assessment. Uh, 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 if you assess a patient, uh, including assessment the history, examination, and in some cases you need some investigation. In history, this is one of the most important uh, difficult intubation, uh, it's good positive. So if the patient told you, I have a difficult intubation history, or have you give a card with this, this is, uh, you should respect this so much of uh, this case, and you prepare yourself as possible because of this history. Uh, but the opposite is not true. If the patient told you, I have a non-eventual non or a smooth uh, uh, surgery before, that does not exclude difficult intubation. Simply, many factors may, can, uh, may occur a change patient from easy ventilation to difficult ventilation. For example, he become obese. For example, he got, uh, so he go have a surgery before, but he become obese. He had a surgery before that, but now his growth hormone is higher. And so the soft tissue become more hypertrophy. Uh, simply, he got and closing spondylosis spondylosis and uh, the neck movement became impaired. So many other fact, maybe he has spinal fixation. So he, before the surgery, he was easy intubation, but after the surgery, he's not. So a history of negative difficult intubation does not exclude risk of difficult intubation. The other important point is assessment. And, and I want to stress in this point in score system. You, uh, there's enough many scores now is used to uh, not only to predict difficulty, but also to grade the difficulty. In some cases, severe difficult intubation or impossible intubation, some case of difficult intubation, but can be managed by certain ways. So many scores that exist, we have in our hospital, Ma'amun score, uh, other cases have lemon or modified lemon, uh, difficult intubation scores, many scores. And I think that every facility must have a reliable, uh, scoring its guidelines. So when they discuss with each other, they have uh, a norm, a one basic speaker, a point physician talk to each other. They know what they're talking about. So, so it should be standardized in every facility. Uh, in some cases, you may need some investigation, like if you have a risk of uh, subluxation, if you have uh, a mass completing the airway, like uh, thyroid uh, enlargement or tumor of the airway. So in some cases, you need to have investigation and to assess the airway patency and deviation uh, by this investigation. So this is the first about to be ready. Because once you're expecting difficult intubation, the scenario is, is markedly different. I'll tell you a small story. A few weeks ago, uh, one of my colleagues called me for uh, patient bariatric and he was unexpected difficult intubation. Uh, he was not that uh, BMI, high BMI, his BMI was less than 40. So they did not expect difficult intubation, but during the procedure of intubation, multiple procedure, the patient got his spasm and he started to be hyperventilated. So my I've been called, I go to my colleague and I start to use glidescope. At that time, I didn't see the vocal cord and I insert the uh, bougie, I, without seeing the vocal cord, I was lucky that bougie go inside the trachea. I advanced that, that you, uh, so at that time, I didn't see anything of the vocal cord at all, even with light scope. The same patient have bleeding uh, from the surgery side and they want to reopen him uh, two days later. At that time, I was ready and fully ready and psychologically prepared that I face difficult intubation. Surprisingly, when I start with blind scope, the view is perfect. So the only explanation to me that I couldn't see it the first time and the second time it was a piece of cake is uh, being psychologically prepared and equipmentally prepared. So if you have uh, uh, equipment and you are designed yourself, you face difficult intubation, everything will go smooth. But if you don't, uh, and you become stressed, especially if some sort of hypoxia or hyperventilation, your talent and your hand skill will diminish. So uh, the, if you are expected difficult situations, it's far, far better and easier management of the case rather than expected difficult intubation. The other thing to be ready is uh, equipment. You prepare 
all equipment of difficult intubation available in your facility. In some cases, if you find that you have a deficiency, market deficiency in this equipment, you may cancel the case and send him to other facility for his safety. Equipment including fiber optic, glide scopes, uh, visual uh, laryngoscopes, uh, supraglottic devices, airways, uh, different sizes, nasal airway, laryngeal masks, different types, blades, McCoy. So whatever, uh, this depends on the facility and the equipment there. One of the new equipment, or not that new, but it's very helpful equipment is nasal flow cannula, high nasal flow. That's you are giving oxygenation, high oxygen flow, and this causing um, maintaining the oxygen saturation through the apnea time up to 10 minutes. So this is a very wonderful equipment. Unfortunately, it's not exist in my hospital. So still I can, yeah, and for some reason I can replace it by high nasal flow, normal cannula, and I use it by high normal flow, about 10 liter or 15 liter. It does not give the same effect, but at least it will give me more oxygenation and better apnea time saturation. Uh, uh, this not equipment, there is another more important than equipment is personnel. So uh, a personnel that you should call them to help you, not only expert, but you may need technicians, more than one technician to help you because you need many, many equipment and you need help. Also, if you have a colleague expert in certain uh, uh, equipment, like he is expert in fiber optic or expert in uh, glide scope or someone of uh, is have a unique experience and something you should call him to support you uh, also uh, in emergency plan if you want to do a tracheostomy so you should or there is high possibility of doing tracheostomy you should arrange this with the ENT surgeon if possible so personnel and arrangement of personnel is it's one of the core of being ready for difficult intubation uh, rule number four is you must have a plan because usually or not usually in many times your plan A doesn't work so you say I'll use this X equipment to ventilate the patient but it's failed so in this scenario you should have a plan and plan B plan C plan D or plan E even in some cases and you should discuss this plan with your colleagues because so the technician who works with you knows what you're going to do, so things will go smoothly and go easily. You discuss this with the nurse technician, with the nurses from the surgical side, with the ENT doctors, with your colleague, and even with the surgeon. So all of them have the same harmony or they are playing the same tone. That's all of them knows what I will do if this technique fails. So this is a very, very, very important point. So because if you have a plan, this, uh, 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 if you don't have a plan, sharp decision during stress is usually wrong. So put a plan first before you have a crisis. Because if you have a crisis, this is decision, your decision in most of time will be not accurate or will not be the best. So if you put the same decision, you take a decision before the crisis, you will take an accurate and or the most accurate decision will be taken. Rather than if you take the same uh, uh, decision under stress control condition. Uh, how to put a plan? We should answer the following four questions to put the, our plan for management of difficult intubation. The first question, if the surgery can be performed under nerve block or not. So if it's yes, so I will go for nerve block or for central axial anesthesia. For example, you have a cesarean section and your surgeon, it's a normal case, it's not complicated, no bleeding. So in this case, and the patient give me history, so I'll go directly for spinal anesthesia. The same for limb surgery. I will go directly for interscaline or, but in this case, you should confirm successful block before starting surgery because I don't want intraoperative surprises. So if you give block, you should assess it very carefully to confirm adequate block before shifting the patient before starting surgery. And if the block is not adequate, you can supplement your block. The same for epidural, the same for spinal. So if you, this is your decision and this is your plan A, you should confirm successful block before starting surgery. If the cesarean section and you continue or the block is not ready or that epidural is not that, the level of epidural is not that high, and you start surgery, surgery, start patient, start pain, you have to put him to sleep and you cannot intubate him. 
So be sure that your block is working before starting the search. So this is question number one. Question number two, no, this case cannot be performed under nil block and I have given Jonah a CZ. In this situation, is supraglottic devices can be enough to ventilate the patient. So this is important. As we said before, most of surgery or many elective surgery can be performed under, under supraglottic device alone. So if this is a case, so thanks God. Third question, if intubation in this case is a must, like you have a cancer larynx, you have the, uh, a case of trauma or burn, and you have to intubate your patient. So if intubation is a must, what the equipment you have here in your facility? And a very important is not enough to have an equipment, you must have an experience in this equipment. Because if you have a fiber optic, but you never use it before, it's, it's nonsense, it it's will not help you. Actually, you will lose time and will use the patient apnea and you will not intubate the patient if you don't have training in this equipment. So the availability of equipment is half of the question. The other half is, are you expert in using this equipment or not? And if you are not expert, you can ask a colleague who is more expert or even canceling the case to another, another facility which has a more equipment. Uh, the other question is, what is the severity of difficult intubation if the patient should be intubated awake in severe cases or should be intubated after giving him inhalational induction or should be intubated after giving him IV induction? So these questions you have to solve before to get a correct or the best plan for specific patient. Last question is, you have to put the bad scenario. If I fail to intubate and if I fail to ventilate, what is my emergency plan? So if you solve this question, inshallah, you will get a smooth intubation or smooth uh, management of the case. Uh, the fifth golden rule is don't repeat a failed trial. A uh, failed trial is not for free. If that every trial you do it for intubation cause the patient trauma to the airway and this trauma may cause bleeding and this bleeding make impairment of the next time of you visualize this airway. So the more trauma you do the airway, the bleeding, and then more secretion, so the visualization for next time become more difficult. The other more serious problem with uh, unsuccessful trial or any trial that you are called the edema of the airway. And so you may start with an easy ventilated patient but because you insist on intubation and you do many, many trials, so you got an airway edema and now the airway become, uh, you can become difficult to be ventilated and you will lose the option to awake the patient up. So don't do trial unless you do something new. Don't repeat a failed trial. Simply, if you don't change anything, it is less successfully, it is less likely you answer the tube. It is the, the instance will go down with every trial. So if you do a failed trial, try to think why I got a failed trial and what could be optimized to, to be successful in the next trial before you try. For example, if the positioning of the patient is not accurate, so you may correct the position. So if the, uh, the patient is tall and you want uh, the, your blade size is not enough, so you may need a five blade five, so maybe blade four is not enough, I need a longer blade. Uh, by the way, in this point, uh, the, the blade size depends on the patient length, not the patient weight. So if the patient is short and 200 kilogram, you may use blade three, but if the patient is long, two meter or something, you may need a blade five. Uh, blade 5 is not uh, commonly available, but there is Blade 5 uh, of laryngoscope to see a, 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 a far epiglottis. Also, in the case of the epiglottis is long, you may use, uh, uh, you think about to use a straight uh, laryngoscope. So every time, uh, whenever you do an unsuccessful trial, you try to think what could be improved so the next trial will be positive, inshallah. 
but never, never, never to repeat the same failed trial. You don't change anything. What do you do think that this next trial will be successful? Uh, ideally, first trial is the best trial. So try your best to make this trial successful because the airway is more or less virgin. So no trauma, no bleeding, no secretion. So first trial will give you better options. So make it as possible. So don't be careless in some cases and put the position positioning adequately. Try to make it a successful trial from first time. Uh, so this is a very important. Don't repeat a failed trial. Uh, one most uh, one more point I want to put it here is after you successfully or unsuccessfully treat this patient, whatever happened and the patient wake up, you should explain to him what happened exactly, and you write a report describe everything everything happened during this journey. So you describe what equipment you use, which was successful which was not. If you use a laryngeal mask, write to a doctor, next doctor, that this type of laryngeal mask is Brucey or uh, uh, Supreme or uh, classic laryngeal mask or flexible laryngeal mask and what size you use and if any trick it should be used in the next trial of intubation. If you use certain type of blades, help you. So say to him, straight blade was okay. Uh, if the patient is easy ventilated or not, so a report, your report is a very, very important point to next doctor who will try with this patient. Uh, in our case today, unfortunately, the doctor tell the patient to difficult intubation, but he doesn't mention to him is he was easy ventilation or not. And this is a very crucial point because if the patient is easy ventilated, you can simply give him uh, IV medication and you will proceed for deeper level of anaphibia. But if the patient got gum with the report, uh, of difficult ventilation, I will never do this uh, trial. So I will never put the patient under anesthesia. So giving the patient a report is a very, very important. I don't know if this should be put as uh, a third rule, a sixth rule, or this is uh, in the management, but giving the patient a, a report of what happened exactly, what is equipment have been used, what was successful, what was successful first trial, second trial, you should use, uh, I use a glidoscope, for example. I use a blade of difficult intubation blade. I use blade rumber uh, size four. Everything, everything should be in detail. In detail, the time of apnea, the type of intubation should be described in this report. But to send the patient with no paper and tell him you are difficult intubation, and then what? Um, uh, I can see that he's difficult intubation. Okay, so this is a very important point I want to clarify also. Difficult intubation, we have three scenarios. The first scenario and the best scenario is expected difficult intubation. A second scenario, you do induction, but after induction, you ventilate the patient, but when you go for intubation, you fail to intubate. So you have a difficult intubation, but the patient is easily ventilated. The last scenario and the worst scenario, and this is what's causing patient to die, is un expected difficult intubation and you cannot ventilate the patient. The difference between these three scenarios actually is the time. Time is the gift from Allah. In the first scenario of expected difficult intubation, you have enough time to prepare yourself, to prepare your room, to prepare your uh, equipment, to assess the patient, to ask a sir, ANT surgeon to come, to arrange everything. And this happening in our case today, inshallah, I will show. The other scenario, the patient is ventilated, so we can maintain his, oh, he, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can maintain his oxygenation and his saturation. So you have time, not, you have not like the first case, but you still you have time because the patient is ventilated. So you ventilate the patient and ask your colleague or the technician to prepare everything. And after everything is prepared, he call for help, uh, you, he prepare, the equipment of difficult intubation, it's better to be in one trolley, so drag the trolley immediately, so drag everything at the same time. However, every facility has its own setup, but uh, the way here that you have some time to rearrange yourself, to re-prepare everything, as long as the patient is easily ventilated. But in last scenario, where the 
unexpected difficult intubation and difficult ventilation, actually, the aim of your aim now is not to maintain the surgery or to undergo the surgery. The main aim of you to save the patient's life because the patient may die if this is not corrected. So in this case, if this is an emergency case, and so you have to take a rapid, correct decisions to save this patient's life. One of the very important, important point now is to not delay the invasive technique too late until it becomes nonsense. So if you cannot do this, don't delay cricocytectomy or tracheostomy. Try to do it. If you failed, it's over. Patient is dying, go on, save his life. So it's a priority in the third scenario to save the patient's life. This is the most important priority. Now we are going discussing our case, which uh, we'll do, we show the life now what we did with it. About 30 years old male, uh, as a one presented uh, for us for nasal surgery. The patient gave us a history that he, uh, try, uh, he um, was presented by this same surgery in another facility. They gave him induction of general anesthesia, but they failed to intubate him. Uh, they were safe doctors, so they wake him up because, uh, uh, but unfortunately they don't give them a report and this bad thing. Uh, so they send, uh, they wake him up and they try to intubate him again with fiber optic, but they also failed with fiber optic, so they canceled the case. And uh, the patient presented to us to be operated. Uh, there were uh, assessment, uh, there is receding mandible, uh, beard, and melambati, grade three. So let's go now to put our plan and we'll answer the question, as we said, to arrange our plan. So first thing is the surgery can be performed under nerve block. Actually it is yes, the nerve surgery can be performed under nerve block, but I'm not expert in this technique. So to me, this option is not available. <coughs> also, and my colleague, there is no uh, expert one who can do nasal surgery under nerve block alone. So. To, uh, to, to me, these options don't exist. So in this case, I will go to question two. If the surgery can be performed by supraglottic device, yes. Nasal surgery can be performed by supraglottic device. So there is some blood may, uh, dry, um, some blood drops may go from the nasopharynx down and have a risk of aspiration, but this can be solved by obstructing the nasopharynx by some cotton or a throat bag or something like this. So still, laryngeal mask can be used in this nasal surgery. If intubation is a must in this case, what is available equipment? In our hospital, we have fiber optic, we have glide scope, we have CMAC. So we have this three uh, equipment and alhamdulillah, I have some experience in, the, in this three techniques. So this is my options in difficult, if I want to intubate him. And we will solve the last question if the patient have difficult intubation, difficult ventilation. So we, uh, uh, we will do cricocytectomy. So this is, so my plan will go like this. In plan A, I will induct, do induction by propofol and trimifentan, and I will insert a laryngeal mask. With the laryngeal mask, I adequately ventilate the patient, we will start the surgery. If not, I will go to plan B. In plan B, I intubating the patient, I will intubate the patient using glide scope. If it work and I have a good view of the vocal cord, it's okay. But if it's not, so I'll go to plan C. I will add to glide scope the fiber optic. So, but in this way, I will need two hands. One will support the glide scope blade and the other will use the fiber optic. So we'll have two view, one from uh, with the glide scope and the other one view from the uh, uh, from the fiber optic. If we can intubate the patient by this technique, it's okay. If not, I will make plan D. If the patient in this situation is easily ventilated, I will cancel him. I will wake him up and I'll cancel the limb or reschedule to another facility. If the patient is difficult intubation at this point, after a failure of intubation by the above glide scope and fiber optic, in this case, I may go to the Acrico uh, Let's see the case. Okay. Uh, thank you. We will go now for the live video. This is our plan A. That's we insert the laryngeal mask. 
It will be inserted under Brufols and Remifentanil. And this is, as I said, this is Blam E. The angel mask doesn't work. We will use uh, a CMAC or video laryngoscopy. And I use it with uh, Bougie as a stylus. And if it works, it's okay. If not, I will add glidescope, or I'm sorry, fiber optic with the glidescope. So the fiber optic is adjusted and the tube is inserted and the zooms and the uh, zoom is adjusted and everything is adjusted in the fiber optic. So that's why we need time play a very good role in this surgery. If you have time, you can prepare yourself. Also, we prepare some relaxant here, if in some cases, in emergency. And we have this nasal cannula. It's not high nasal flow, but still it will help. We will put it during, uh, uh, during the induction, so it will help to maintain some oxygenation during the apnea time. But as I said, uh, ideally it should be uh, a high oxygen nasal flow if it's possible or if it's available. Uh, Supraglottic devices are uh, uh, located here in this trolley. And so we'll start with the oxygenation. And the pre-oxygenation will maintain the uh, oxygen, uh, high flow oxygen and maintain the patient away until the expiratory oxygen concentration is beyond, beyond a 95, uh, I'm sorry, 90 uh, percent. MashaAllah, 1,600. It's a good time of volume, again. The big guy, we give him 300 milligrams of mobile food. When you got apnea, I will put the range of When you become apneic, I will put the range Now, you become apneic. So the laryngeal mask working perfectly. So now we can adjust our ventilation and timing. 500, respiration 14, we can go lower. We will adjust this management. So we successfully, then we successfully, we can start. Okay. So fully awake, when you're fully awake, we remove the laryngeal mask and that's it. Uh, okay, everything was very smooth. Please open your mouth. Thank you so much.